St. Jerome said, There is nothing more excellent, nothing more desirable than humility, for it is the chief preserver and guardian of all virtues. St. Gregory compared humility to the root of a flower. It is the root which provides all of the life of the flower. When the flower is plucked from the root, it quickly withers. The root lies in the ground and has no beauty or fragrance, but it is nevertheless the principle of the plant's life and nourishment. St. Augustine says that all virtues which are not rooted in humility are not true virtues, but virtues only in appearance. For those who are prideful practice virtue only for worldly esteem. God rewards such virtues, fake as they are, only with the good things of this world, which are good only in appearance, inasmuch as they are merely created images of the eternal good. And so we see that the evil people in this life do some good, and they are rewarded in this life with worldly goods. St. Margaret Mary Alacoque set down these rules for herself. I will consider all those who afflict or speak ill of me as my best friends and will endeavor to do them all the service and all the good that lies in my power. I will endeavor not to speak of myself or at least very briefly and never if possible in praise or justification. I will regard myself as a beggar in the house of God who ought to be submissive to all and to whom all is is done and given through charity. And I will always think that I have too much. St. Philip Neri, if he heard that anyone had committed a serious crime, would say, thank God that I have not done worse. He also used to say, the wound in Christ's side is large, but if God did not guard me, I would make it larger. Toward the end of his life, when he was ill, he said, Lord, if I recover, so far as I am concerned, I shall do more evil than ever, because I have promised so many times before to change my life and have not kept my word, so that I despair of myself. St. Francis de Sales said, The highest degree of humility is not only to acknowledge willingly our own abjection, lowliness, but to love it and to take delight in it. And this not from meanness of soul or cowardice of heart, but from a desire to exalt as we ought the divine majesty and to prefer others far before ourselves. The Book of Wisdom says the just man is the first accuser of himself. St. Albert the Great said that he who will acquire humility ought to plant the root of it in his heart. That is, he ought to make it his study to find out his own weakness and misery and to comprehend not only how weak and miserable he is, but to what a degree weakness of weakness he would be reduced if God had not shielded him from the occasions of sin and helped him in temptations. And St. Francis of Assisi said, I am fully convinced that had the greatest sinner received the same favors that I have, he would have made better use of them than I have done. 
And on the contrary, I firmly believe that if God should withdraw his hand from me for even one moment, I would fall into the most extravagant enormities in the world and be the worst of men. Therefore do I look upon myself as the greatest and most ungrateful of all sinners. Now these people are saints. They are saints because they understand their own lowliness. And they speak about their own lowliness without the slightest hesitation. Now we should garner the following lessons from these saints concerning humility. First, humility is the condition of all other virtue. That is to say, that there can be no true virtue, not even natural virtue, if the virtuous acts are done out of a motive of pride. For a virtuous act must be good in all of its aspects in order to be truly virtuous. Hence, even to give a great amount of money to the poor for the sake of obtaining the praise of others would be a sin. Because the work, although good in itself, if we isolate the alleviation of the sufferings of the poor, that's a wonderful thing. But the work as a moral act becomes bad because of the corrupting motive of pride. <clears throat> pride and vanity, therefore, become the ruination of our good deeds. Or at least they can diminish them. Diminish the virtue of them, the ardor of them, and therefore diminish the merit of them in the case where the pride and vanity is only venial. This is often the case of people who live good lives and who accomplish everyday virtuous acts. They diminish, nonetheless, the good and the merit of these acts to the extent that they are tainted with vanity. A virtuous act without any pride or vanity, is like 24 carat gold. But the more you add the vanity and the pride in the virtuous act, the gold content goes down. And if you completely corrupt the act with pride, it is nothing more than a piece of tin. The second lesson from these saints is, as St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, the way of humility is humiliation. When we pray to overcome our pride, as we should do every day, God will visit us with humiliations of all kinds. These humiliations come to us like acid upon metal. When poured upon our pride, our pride hisses and bubbles up as these humiliations eat away at it. And that's good. That's good when the humiliation strikes and it's painful. That's when it's doing good. We would sooner do severe mortification of the senses than to accept humiliation. Why? Because our pride, our love of self, our self-esteem, our vanity are far more precious to us than our food or any other pleasure. We see from the saints that not only should these humiliations be bravely endured, but actually welcomed, sought. This is the perfection of humility that we rejoice in humiliation. And why do the saints so rejoice? Not because humiliation is 
fun in itself or something that is desirable in itself. It is desirable for something else. And that something else is this. These saints are so filled with a knowledge of the majesty of God that they rejoice in perceiving their own lowliness because it is the truth. Standing next to the enormity of the majesty of God, they see themselves as very, very tiny. As when you stand next to a great mountain or a great skyscraper, you perceive your own lowliness. So they are constantly aware of the majesty and the glory of God. And therefore, lowliness is truth. They perceive the truth. And you rejoice in any truth that you may discover. Our lowliness is as true as God's majesty is true. And for this, they rejoice in discovering their own lowliness. They rejoice in the truth. St. Teresa said, humility is truth. Truth about what we are. They furthermore understand, by the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the value of the Holy Cross in the order of salvation. They see these humiliations as participations in the cross of Christ which they deeply desire to have, which they desire, that is to say, they desire to participate in the cross of Christ out of love for our Lord. Sometimes we get the impression that our holy faith is a type of exchange between God and us, that we go to Mass and we say rosaries and we do other good things And God is expected to hand us back a nice life in this world. And therefore, when things go wrong, if a child should suffer or die, or other things terrible happen to us, we say, how could God do this to us? I'm a faithful Catholic. I say my prayers. You don't understand the Holy Cross. You don't understand the path of salvation. It is written all through the gospel. You don't understand the most fundamental aspect of our faith. This is not a place of showering worldly gifts upon you. This is a place of taking up your cross and following Christ and sanctifying your soul thereby. The saints understand this. This is the wisdom of the saints. And part of that carrying of the cross is humiliation. And it is one of the most difficult crosses to bear because pride is so dear and so intimate to our souls which are corrupted to a great extent by original sin and corrupted by the many actual sins of pride and vanity that we have committed. The third lesson that we must learn today is that it is necessary to understand that the good that we do is principally from God's grace. You see St. Francis of Assisi, if it weren't for the grace of God, I would be the most hard sinner in the world. And the other saints said similar things. That they understood how much God is holding them up, sustaining them in grace, that the good that they have is all from God. Of ourselves, we are weak and inconstant. And if given the opportunity, we would fall into the most depraved vices. We should thank God, therefore, not only for the interior graces by which he sustains us, but also for the many exterior graces which have been willed by God for us from all eternity. Where I was born into what family and circumstances was I born. The parents that I had, the priests and religious that I had, instructing me and do now have, the catechism which I received, the discipline which I received from my parents 
and from priests and nuns and so forth. The sermons which I hear, these are all external graces. And they sustain you together with the interior graces that God gives you. They sustain you. These exterior graces contribute a great deal to our eternal salvation and, as I said, are willed by God for that precise purpose. <clears throat> Where would we be without these graces? These saints would say that they would be the worst of sinners without these graces of humility, these graces of instruction. Think of the billions of people who do not have these graces, those who have never known the Catholic faith and who never will, who will lead their whole lives in ignorance of the most important aspects of human existence and human salvation, ignorance about the most important things of life, and I'm not talking only about those who are in the jungles of Brazil. I'm talking about those who are educated and rich. Ignorant about the most fundamental and important things of life, even though they may have doctorates because of their pride. Think of the hundreds of millions of people who receive the true faith from their parents. Hundreds of millions and who have lost it because of Vatican II and its reforms. Just as so many people lost it during the Protestant Reformation, raised as good Catholics, and then lost it, and who are now raising their children in the new and false religion, just as those fallen away Catholics did in the Protestant Reformation, raise their children as good Protestants. Thank God for the graces that you have. The fourth lesson from the saints is that we should study our own faults. We should know ourselves, as St. Augustine says. We should stare at our many past sins, come before the Blessed Sacrament and stare at our many past sins as God stares at them. Think of how many sins you commit in one day. Multiply that by 365. Multiply that by your age, minus seven years for the time when you didn't know what you were doing. Listen to your own confessions. How you confess over and over again the same sins. You should find in that repetition of sin not only your own faults, your own tendencies to sin, but also your own inconstancy and weakness. Find the extent of your own self-love and the frailty of your love of God. The Gospel of today's Mass instructs us to take the last place at table. Pray to God that he send you the grace of humility and the concomitant humiliations so that you gain, if in a small way, the perfection of humility which we found in these sayings of the saints today. And that we be attracted to the last place in all things not out of a petty modesty, but in the way that a stone is pulled to the ground by gravity, convinced by the grace of God through, through our weakness and tendency to sin that we are the worst of all men. St. Paul said, Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.